we're presenting our uh, group, our the Regina group on Treaty Four land. Dr. Garcia, uh, what is your treaty land number? Do you know? Um, I think we're four. If I remember yeah. correctly. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And uh, and uh, all in truth and reconciliation, we want to be sincere and true of heart with that. Uh, group guidelines. Now, as you notice, uh, our Zoom instructions, um, they're all on the bottom task bar. The most important one for our people that are joining us is the chat. And if you wish to raise your hand, that should be under your reactions button if you have a question. Now, uh, I usually leave it up to our presenters and I at times will ask our, our, our group to either pop in uh, in the chat uh, function if they have a question throughout the, the session or please write it down. And what we can do is parking lot it and put it at the end of our presentation. And then we bring all our questions forward to Dr. Garcia. Uh, or Dr. Garcia, do you like the questions all throughout the pre presentation? Well, I think if uh, when I'm giving the presentation, I may not see it as well throughout. Okay. So it might okay. be best to try and park them. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. And um, if you do not, we ask all of you to please mute your mic. And that's so that we don't get feedback from your mics. And I believe James and I have the ability to mute you as well if we need to. We are recording and if you do not wish to have your face recorded, you can also uh, go down to your uh, video and just have a blank screen and we'll have your name there as well. Uh, let's see here. Um, now, during our sessions, we do share personal experiences. We will not give out or advocate one uh, treatment or another or give out any form of um, of uh, 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 medical advice. We do leave that up to our medical professionals and Dr. Garcia is that is our medical professional and I am also a registered nurse and I still hold my license and I still have my insurance to help, you know, you know, it, it, just in case, you know, certain things happen, but Dr. Garcia is the main man. And we ask that if you have any questions or anything, please go to your own physician or healthcare team. And for that reason is that they know your information. We, Dr. Garcia and I do not know your personal information. So, but we will try to help you navigate as best we can through the system. Um, now, in because we are in a large group and we have uh, several people coming to uh, ask questions and that, we want you to be mindful of your time spent and uh, so that everyone has an opportunity to uh, ask questions and uh, you know just to be respectful of each other. Uh, let's see here. Okay, just wanna make sure I've got all. All right, now I'm gonna introduce Dr. Garcia, fondly Dr. Garcia. And it's always a pleasure to have Dr. Garcia join us. Uh, Dr. Garcia is an MD, CRCS, FRCSC. And he's, uh, he's going to be giving us a presentation on prostate cancer, a partner's disease. Uh, Q&A will follow uh, uh, once we're done and peer sharing. He is a urologist and a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Surgery, Saskatchewan Health Authority and University of Saskatchewan and located in Swift Current, Saskatchewan. He trained in London, Ontario as a medical doctor and specializes as a urologist and completed a fellowship in, now let's see if I can pronounce this correctly, Dr. Garcia, andrology. Now is that in, the, in, in regards to antigen therapy? Andrology? Uh, andrology is more specific to uh, male sexual hormone manipulation. Great, thank and, you. And uh, sexual medicine. And sexual medicine. Under a global recognized leader in the field and member of Sexual Medicine and Society of North America, Dr. Garcia has a passion for the quality of life for his partners. He treats men diagnosed with prostate cancer and advocates that this is a one population that can, can be better served and post-treatment intervention. And Dr. Garcia has been helping, uh, helping us advocate for a men's health clinic specializing in prostate cancer uh, here in, the, um, in Regina and lower or uh, Southern Saskatchewan. So with that, 
I say thank you, Dr. Garcia, for joining us. And the floor is yours now, sir. Okay, uh, great. I just need the ability to screen share again. Uh, it still is disabled. You, ha uh, you have that ability. Uh... Oh, no, you're right. I thought I did. Now you do. There we are. Okay. All right, so everybody can see the, uh, the, the slides. Can everybody see the slides? I just want to make sure before I get going. I can see the slides, Dr. Okay. I can see the slides, yeah. All right. So, um, like, uh, thank you for the very kind introduction. Uh, like it was suggested, um, we often do talk a lot about the uh, dysfunctions associated with uh, prostate cancer, uh, sexual urinary, otherwise. Uh, we also talk a lot about consequences of treatment. And most of that conversation usually is surrounding what's happening to the patient. Uh, so one of the slight diversions I wanted to take this time was actually to really bring in uh, what it is from a more visceral and, and emotional level to go through the diagnosis um, and some things that are probably make a lot of sense, but we're never ever said plainly. Um, and similarly, also to talk about the fact that, well, they, a lot of these patients have partners and there, there may be a real interest in wanting to uh, become involved again in a more intimate way. And they may have their own challenges. And what are some ways that we can address those challenges and sort of move forward? So it, we're, we're, hitting a, uh, we're hitting a couple of different uh, areas here. Now, the context of this presentation is going to be uh, mostly aimed in a heterosexual way. Certainly, there are very specifics that could be more unique uh, in um, in a homosexual or other relationships, but most of the focus and research that we have here is tends to be more heterosexually oriented. So, uh, so one this th was a presentation I think I did back in January, which is but similar to this one. There was, there's a lot of overlap, so those who are in that one will see some slides that look very familiar. Uh, but I do want to kind of talk about some of this the cultural background of sexuality and more specifically as it relates to men. And once we kind of get through that, it'll make sense why I spent the time on that, uh, talking about some of the sexuality, the, the benefits of sexuality outside the bedroom, um, and then again, sexual dysfunctions that might be occurring in the partners and how we, what we can do to try and address those. So there's always been a degree of cultural fascination with the penis all through human history. Uh, it's represented so much in all these different cultures and People have literally spent months, if not years, slowly carving out sculptures to have a very intricately designed penis on it. There is this, uh, it's, you see it in across all these different cultures across the world and in cultures that didn't even speak with each other. Uh, so we can see it going all the way back to ancient Samaria. We see it in Egypt and even some of the Egyptian hieroglyphs uh, in ancient Greek. And in fact, there is this uh, Greek god named Priapus. Uh, who has a comically large uh, penis to the point that it uh, requires a crane. Uh, this is a very interesting, this is this uh, one tribe, a pre incan tribe out of Peru, uh, which obviously would have no communication with any of these other societies who a lot of their mason jars and things that they poured their drinks out of were things like this. Uh, I think many of us have heard of the Kama Sutra before. And then modern day Bhutan, uh, there's this uh, these festivals that are very surrendered uh, centered around very phallic centric uh, uh, type celebrations. And you can even go back to good old fashioned graffiti. This is 1800, 1,800 year old Roman graffiti on Hadrian's wall in the north of, uh, in Scotland and in, between Scotland and England. And the Roman soldiers had nothing better to do than slowly carve out a penis while they were on duty. So there's a lot of cultural overtones to the penis. Um, there's, whether we like it or not, uh, culturally, there's a significant value that's placed on the size and function of the penis. Um, there are incorrect conclusions that a lot of men, particularly under youth, will pick up and carry throughout their life, that somehow a larger size and a stronger function is somehow indicative of one's masculinity or power. Uh, and a lot of men throughout history and today will take any affliction, disease, or problem that's occurred to the penis as some sort of a direct comment or attack on their own personal value. Uh, and it's even a even further supported by our language. Many times we'll see articles that'll come out and they'll describe 
the, uh, the penis, instead of using the word penis, which I don't understand why they don't, uh, they'll use a euphemism like manhood, which is a very interesting, uh, interesting way of describing things. So what are these consequences relative to medicine? Kind of, you know, we went on a little bit of a trip. I'm going to try and sort of bring this back into something kind of relevant to what I want to talk about today. Well, conditions and procedures that can affect size uh, and the potential size can be minimally bothersome from a structural biologic point of view. You know, when you're kind of thinking, hey, does, does this guy have enough of a penis that he's going to be able to engage sexually and he's going to be able to um, have intercourse with his partner? The answer could be yes. But even if he's had some real slight changes to the point where he can notice those changes, um, what the, the mental toll of that change in alteration to his penis can be really quite taxing. Uh, conditions that affect function can make some men feel as if they have lost some core component to their masculinity. Um, and if you find some way of restoring that function, you do restore that some of that sense of self, which can be really important to some of these guys. Uh, and then in essence, when we're considering a psychological consequence of a diagnosis or a problem, uh, the patient often considers their penis as some complete manifestation of their masculinity. And then you tell them it's broken. It's not working. That's a very sharp cut. And it's difficult for some men to acknowledge that in a way that makes them comfortable that they can speak about it even in never mind seeking care and trying to improve things and, and realize that it's not a personal attack. And, and this can be a really tough thing for some men to get past. Um, and we often see a similar sort of associations when it comes to fertility. You see a young man uh, in a new relationship, they're trying to conceive and start a family and they're struggling. And they have a lot of these same senses, these same uh, almost personal attacks and feelings that they have towards themselves. So what are some key points, how can I wrap this up in terms of maybe a message to the partners uh, when we're when you're trying to support your partner post prostate cancer treatment? Well, like it or not, culturally, we value sexual potency as a defining feature of being a man. It's ridiculous. It's uh, obtuse, but it's what we've all been agreed. It's an agreed upon narrative that we've had probably since our days in high school or even earlier. We just our, our initial reactions, our gut thoughts are that this is true. And when a man loses potency, either through disease or treatment, the effect can be really profound, even on one's own self-esteem. Uh, and that's not something that every man is going to be willing to admit either. Um, it's important to have, again, that open communication to bring these topics up and talk about it. But kind of hearing culturally where this is all coming from, it's a really deep-seated feeling, and it's a, it can feel like a really deep-seated hurt or attack. Uh, Something that we don't often talk about is that regardless of what kind of prostate cancer treatment we're giving, a lot of men, majority, will have some degree of shortening over the first year or so. Um, we really should be saying it more often at the beginning of treatments, but it happens. And a lot of men can really feel quite a lot, mass, quite a lot less masculine as a result, um, through no fault of their own, of course. So one part of this is really to try and address the issues directly as much as you can through open communication. It's a really great first step. One, sometimes men even have just difficulty identifying that you know they're having these complex feelings and that this is part of the problem. And just being able to identify and sort of expose those issues uh, and how unfounded they are is really important. So, you know, discussing how many things that can make them masculine and make them your chosen partner that have absolutely nothing to do with sexual activity. And most partners are going to have a laundry list of those things. Identifying that you're okay and accepting this new version of him. It's, you, it, you may not be able to connect the same way as you always had historically, but you're going to find something new. You're going to find new ways. And it doesn't always have to be about penetration. There's lots of ways of, ex of expressing that intimacy in physical ways. And again, that's kind of what this last point is exploring other ways of mutual intimacy. And you know, some I know that some folks really do have some uh, hangups and some, uh, uh, some shyness around the idea of introducing different toys and things like that into the bedroom. This might be the time. Yeah, you, everybody might have a bit of a physical limitation as to what they can do, but this might be the time to talk about that just so that everybody can have, enjoy themselves and can feel that physical, intimate, close connection uh, with their partner. So often erectile issues are a problem. However, the sensation to the head 
is almost always preserved, except in some very specific situations. So a lot of guys will often think, well, if I can't have an erection, that means I just can't have sexual pleasure at all. That's not true. Uh, the nerves and the ability to have an erection is a completely separate set of nerves and function as to the ability to have sensation that's going to lead to pleasure and an orgasm. Those are completely distinct things, and they may not, you can have a, an orgasm having a completely soft penis. It's entirely possible. It's all the direction and sensitivity has to be directed towards the head. Uh, sometimes what we call the frenulum, it's that little web space on the underside of the penis. There's lots of nerve endings there too. Um, and direct attention to both of those, whether that be through direct touching, whether that be through a toy, uh, lots of ways. But that can then allow a guy to go on and, and have some degree of sexual pleasure, even without any real concept of having any sort of direction. So, well, do women even think about sex during major illnesses? Well, a really interesting study this has done. This is a little bit of a sidestep again, but they went through and talked to some women who are in a very large cancer center in uh, downtown New York, and they were in the waiting room and they were waiting for their own cancer treatments. And these were non-gynecologic, non-sexually specific cancers. They are women who are there getting their bowel cancers or their lymphomas treated or you know, thyroid tumors or something like that was being treated and they were there in the waiting rooms. And they just asked them, you know, uh, how concerned are you about your sexual activity, your vaginal health? You know, but that's not at all what they're there for. And about three quarters were somewhat to very concerned about what's going on. Uh, so it's, it's more common than not for women, even when they're sick, to still have some thoughts and concerns about their sexual health and what's going on. And why am I bringing this up? Well, I'm bringing this up because I have seen this pattern as well in, in couples who, uh, when the, the male partner has a prostate cancer and they're going through some sexual difficulties and they're recognizing that not being able to perform and or satisfy their wife the way that they used to is, is affecting them in terms of their own self sense, uh, sorry, self uh, sense and self worth, that many of them will just say, you know what, I'm just going to deny, deny my needs and deny my, my requests. Um, it's going to be a sacrifice that I'll make for the relationship. Uh, and I'm not going to ask, bother, or do anything for my own sexual desires and needs. I'll deny myself to protect the ego, to protect the, the self-worth of my partner. And it's really not necessary because there's always a way that we can find a way to be intimate. It may not be exactly how it was, but there's always ways to do this. Um, it's completely normal. Don't feel guilty about still having some of those sexual desires or wanting to be pleasured in some way. Uh, it doesn't even have to be, again, the sexual pleasure. It can just be that physical closeness and intimacy. Um, it is totally normal to still have those desires and you're not a bad or carnal or moral person for doing so. Uh, and in fact, even if your partner can't engage in any way that they used to, uh, just even if they're using a toy. Uh, I've even had a, a couple of discussions with some men who would talk to me about, you know, I'm, I'm not even, it's not even part of me. They would actually use a strap on and it has no connection to them whatsoever. But knowing that they were able to, when they were, when they wanted to uh, be with their wife, they were able to, to penetrate their wife in a way that was similar to what they had done before, have those moments, have those physical intimate ways, even though the, the, the toy was doing all the work. Uh, they felt found that very satisfying because they felt like they were able to provide that satisfaction for their partner like the old days. So finding some creative ways to, to get that mutual satisfaction between the two of you can do a, real, a whole lot for increasing and improving not only your bond, but everybody's quality of life in the room. So what are some of the challenges to sexual rehabilitation after cancer? Well, there's a lot. For men, you've got some things that are pretty sim similar, like the erection difficulty. I didn't put on their changes in ejaculation, but if you do lose your prostate or if it gets cooked with radiation, you tend to have either no ejaculation or uh, very little. For, for, for some women, it could be more about dryness, lubrication, and pain, but everybody can have some desire changes, some sensation changes, changes in the intensity of the orgasm, what happens, uh, what the orgasm feels like, after a guy maybe had his prostate removed, can feel a little bit different. Um, and in fact, they can even have some urinary leakage sometimes when they have an orgasm. Again, with women, similarly speaking, there can be some uh, urinary leakage just with orgasm, with sexual activity, 
uh, feeling that they're leaking uh, when they're trying to engage in sex. And if you feel like you're you're losing urine while you're trying to have sex, it doesn't make you feel very sexy and it doesn't really make you feel like you want to do that very much. So what are some of the goals? I really want to try and manage the symptoms to enhance pleasure and connection as much as you can between yourself and your partner. You do want to try to minimize distractions to sexual response. So this, you know, if you there are some of these things that can be fixed. If lubrication is an issue and that's distracting you, well, then adding in some external lubrication could be really helpful. Um, if there's urinary concerns and leakage, easy things are trying to empty your bladder before, but if it's still an ongoing problem, then maybe you need to seek some health care so we can get things to work so that you don't leak as much. Uh, don't forget about using some aids, lubrication, uh, you know, if there's dryness, lubrication, pain issues in the female partner, some certain hormonal creams can really reverse that, get things much more comfortable. Erectile aids, whether they're pills, injections, or surgical devices, those are all can be very useful in, in getting the, uh, the penis to work again the way that we would uh, historically have worked. And again, don't forget the toys. Uh, I'm going to say this a couple of times throughout this. Don't forget the toys. They're not dirty. They're very normal and they can be a real benefit to a receptor to a relationship. So not some of the physical stuff, but emotionally, there's a, there's a lot of baggage in here too. There's fear of pain. You're trying something new. Is this going to be comfortable? Whether it be fear of pain from, uh, from the uh, female partner receiving or whether it be fear of pain that, well, you know, if I do give myself some degree of an erection and try to penetrate, is this going to hurt? Is this going to be comfortable? Is this going to feel different? Uh, things are going to feel a little different regardless. And just being aware that, yeah, you you have this change in sensation, you have this change in uh, how things are being experienced for you, it immediately pulls you right back to the fact that you've had a cancer diagnosis, and then you get into fear of recurrence. And it's it's something that does come up, and you do need to talk about and address it. Just like when we, a lot of us were starting our sexual lives, performance anxiety, is still going to be it's still going to be a thing. It's almost like you hit the reset button on your sexual life. Now you got to figure out how you're going to do things in this new fashion, in this new way. Um, like I said before, there can be length and size changes, both in, for men and women. And you could be very acutely aware of that. Um, and that can be something that you can be focusing on and really worried about. And that falls in quite nicely into the last point where you can have this fear and this concern that you, you're failing to satisfy your partner. Uh, and what does that mean? And, and how does that reflect on you as a loving partner? So you really need to, to quiet this cognitive chatter. Um, really discussing these concerns, even no matter how irrational they might seem, expose them for being unhelpful and unfounded. You know, if you feel and you're worried about, you know, the, the, the satisfaction you're able to give to your partner or size and length concerns, if you have a good talk about it, and really expose the fact that these are not concerns, then it should help to shut that down. So then it's not something that's spinning around in your head the entire time you're trying to be intimate. Um, and then to also be more mindfully connected to some of those bodily changes and sensations. Well, this is the new you. It's it's like you have a nice, you have a new car now, but maybe it has some parts that don't work quite as well. You got to figure out how this is going to work. Explore the new body, explore everything that's new. And then you have this connection confidence problems that come with rehabilitation after cancer. Uh, some will feel just not confident about their body at all. Their body's changed. They have scars. They have uh, things that are different. Um, they can be frustrated by those changes due to treatments. And sometimes can even almost feel disconnected. Like, this, this isn't me. This isn't my body. Um, well, fortunately, it is. And you do have to sometimes explore those bodies and, and reconnect. Uh, they often talk about this thing called... Uh, sensate focus and what we talk about in sensate focus is that uh, your partner is sort of exploring you and your body uh, but not in a sexual way just about touching different experiences um, not necessarily touching you know genital tissue or anything like that and just sort of exploring the body and then you just being very acutely aware of what that touch feels like where is it pressure or is it feeling like it's warm uh, and just really trying to melt all the rest of the real world away. And then that allows some real connection with your own body. So you're more comfortable with your own body and allows you to feel, uh, well, quite frankly, more comfortable with it when you're going to be trying to engage in any sort of intimacy. Uh, again, the, the classic uh, spontaneous 
erectile base penetrative intercourse might be off the table uh, and there might be ways to bring it back as well. But that also might mean you have to expand the repertoire. Uh, that might mean not just the introduction of toys, and I told you it's gonna come up several times, uh, but expanding in different ways of stimulating each other. There might be things that uh, you know might not have worked well for you before that are gonna be more enjoyable now. Um, as long as you do it in an open communicative way and make sure everybody has good communication about what's safe, what's not safe, and what's comfortable, feel free to explore. Bring some toys into the bedroom. Uh, there are not just the classic toys. I know when I say toys, I'm sure everybody thinks of a giant phallic looking vibrating dildo or something like that. That is the least of the kind of toys I'm talking about. Uh, there are some really great toys that uh, some of which are hands-free and will sit and stimulate the, the female partner, allowing for penetration at the same time. Some that have motors and a little bit of a squeeze on the base of the penis to try and help trap some of the blood, but also the motor helps with mutual pleasure and satisfaction. The one that has a bit of a tongue that goes back behind and underneath, uh, uh, underneath the scrotum, between the scrotum and the bum there. And because the motors are moving there, they're directly stimulating some of those nerves going to the penis. So there's there's lots of interesting, different kinds of toys that can be used uh, to try and engage the sexual activity uh, that, that it can occur after cancer treatment. So kind of going to that second point, well, what are some of the benefits of being sexual outside the bedroom? You know, why, why focus so much on this? It's, you know, I'm talking about the partners and the partner supporting, and that's great. Well, there has to be a payout aside from just feeling great when you're physically intimate. And there are some payouts to can, trying to continue to be sexual. Um, now, we're again, a little bit of a sidestep here because we're going to be talking mostly just about sexual dysfunction and different chronic disability, which is kind of what we're at, particularly when you've had your treatment of some sort, and now you're dealing with the consequences of the treatment and hopefully you're cancer free. This is one not even cancer related. This had to do with multiple sclerosis and huge database with lots of questionnaires. But what was very interesting is that the sexual dysfunction problems that these women had, uh, mostly women, I should say, um, had a much larger negative impact on their own mental health and their well-being than did their limitations from their physical disabilities. So they were much more bothered by changes, abnormalities, uh, and limitations with their sexual function than they were about the fact that they could not walk. And it's really interesting that that kind of puts things in perspective that I think because we sometimes culturally feel like sex is kind of a bit of a dirty topic um, and you know that we're somehow amoral or, or uh, dirty for wanting to explore that, that it's uh, the idea that it actually is really important and sometimes even more important than physical disability is a really interesting concept kind of spins the, some of the cultural narratives on its head. And I think really does speak that as much as we want to kind of sort of brush it aside and say, like, oh yeah, that was not important. It's probably more important to a lot of people than they're willing to admit. And it's okay to admit that. It's okay to still want to be sexual beings uh, with each other. Uh, interestingly, we found that when we are looking at orgasms and sexual activity in regards to chronic pain, well, this, these mostly were studies done in women, but increased orgasm frequency um, had a better control with chronic pain in some of these women. Uh, they were able to demonstrate that even women with complete spinal cord injuries, uh, that they were still able to get the benefits of orgasm above the level of where they had their injury, which is really interesting and cool. Uh, and then they also had an increased pain threshold in women shortly after orgasm, which was also really interesting. Now, a lot of these can be parroted over into men as well, uh, but really just sort of focusing on both. There are benefits outside the bedroom when it comes to uh, when it comes to sexual activity. Now, sexual health and activity uh, they also can have an effect on promoting their own self esteem. So, this was looking. This is again mostly women, but it was looking at them who are having desire problems. And what degree of an impact was this having on them and their relationships? So negative impacts that were reported by patients uh, that they attributed to the fact that they had low desire 
just because they had low desire, they already started to also have low uh, opinions of their own body and body image. Uh, their self-confidence was affected. They did not feel as connected to their partners. They were communicating less and there's less worry. I'm uh, sorry, there is more worry about your partner satisfaction in the relationship. Um, I didn't put a slide in on this other study, but there's a very interesting one that has to do with men who have uh, significant erectile dysfunction, whether it be because the erections aren't working or there's too much of a curve for them to have sex. And it found that in those situations where they're unable to engage sexually, um, that the amount of non-intimate touching, so that's the shoulder squeeze, the hand hold, the kiss on the cheek, kiss on the forehead, you know, hand on the small of your back, all of those sort of motions are a lot less. And once you correct the sexual dysfunction such that they can engage in an intimate way again, or give them a solution, a way of being able to engage sexually, a lot of those small moments come back. And the using the old baseball analogy, if you're not going to make it to home plate, why bother going to first base? And that's kind of the, the analogy that we'll sometimes talk about or use. So those small moments, they carry a lot of meaning. Perhaps in some relationships have more meaning than the actual sexual intimacy. Uh, they're the small moments of, that carry a lot of value and a lot of import to the couple, uh, knowing that you're being nurtured and cared for even in these difficult times. So now this is a really interesting study in how they did it. They, they managed to find a way to kind of actually calculate the percentage value added and detracted. But when sex is present or good, it seems to add around 15 to 20% value to a relationship or at least how the couple values uh, their relationship. However, when it's bad or non-existent or really hurts and uncomfortable, it can really drain a lot out of the relationship. What's not clear is how much of this has to do with the abnormal or difficult sexual activity causing a strain itself, um, or if this is due to a lot of what we talked about at the beginning there, which is self, uh, self-confidence, body image, communication issues. So that stat's a little bit muddy, but at the end of the day, really all it's sort of saying is that you can add some more value to the relationship by being physically intimate in some way. Um, so again, this is a benign problem, talking about psoriasis and the skin condition, and just seeing women who have more severe psoriasis, particularly if they're having some skin condition on their genitals and genital lesions, it really contributes a lot to the fact that they have some sexual dysfunctions. And you see the same thing with men as well. They have a much more likelihood of sexual dysfunction if they have some of those lesions in and around or close to their genitalia. Uh, this first one here is this one's again is for a bit of a sidestep, but this is all to illustrate a point. Um, this is talking about childhood cancer survivors. So these are they had they had cancer as a kid, they were not sexual beings at the time, but almost a third of them, and these are young, these are all 20s and 30s, almost a third of them are already having sexual dysfunctions by the time they engage in sexual activity. Uh, females more often than men. And I think a major portion of this has to do with, you know, we, we, we do these cancer treatments, we get these patients uh, through their very difficult times, and they, they get this sense of being quite fragile and get this sense of being um, not normal. And then we're asking them to go and be normal. And they're not really sure how to re-engage sexually uh, because they never really ever had normal sexuality to begin with. So it's, it's a complex situation, but it's again, weighing on the importance of going through something stressful and not acknowledging that you went through something stressful as far as how that's gonna to relate to your sexuality. Uh, this last one is the same spirit, but super interesting because these are young men who had testicular cancer. Um, they would have had a testicle taken out. That would be it. They had, they were just on surveillance. So they had absolutely no therapy whatsoever aside from the set one surgery. So there should be absolutely no effect on sexual functioning. However, the stress of the procedure, sorry, the stress of the cancer diagnosis and the kind of constant fear of having a recurrence does lead to some dysfunctions. And these are, for, for testicular cancer survivors, they are all young men. This is a cancer of your teens and your early 20s. That's when this happens. So if you're looking here, you have a quarter of teens as a result of this 
having a loss of their desire. And it's, again, it's around this anxiety and this worry about how do you be sexual, particularly when now your genitalia has been altered, you're missing a testicle. It, and it can really, you know, trickle down to some orgasm problems, uh, sexual dissatisfaction. Um, and again, these guys had no therapy. You can't blame the cancer in any way. You can't blame the fact that they had chemotherapy or radiation, nothing. This, there's no other reasons aside from the psychological toll of the cancer diagnosis and its outcomes is the only reason to explain that. Now, let's talk about some of the folks who are a little bit older in the room um, and they looked at uh, those adults who are in heterosexual relationships long term um, who uh, were 50 to 89 and then they made some adjustments for age and education and things like that. But they found were continuing to maintain their sexuality in some fashion, uh, both men and women, that they had some improvements in how well uh, their cognition, they kind of gave them these cognitive tests to see how they did. And they seemed to do better in those who were still engaging in sexuality and still uh, pursuing that. So now we've sort of come a little bit of full circle where, okay, we've, we've talked about some of the importance of sex, uh, you know, for those who still wanted to, to do it, it's not a requirement, obviously but that it's certainly justified if you want to pursue and try and re-engage sexually in some way, even though it'll be a different way. Uh, we've talked a little bit about you know, some of the emotional and psychological weight of what these diagnoses actually mean to the man, to the man with prostate cancer. Um, and you know, a few creative ways about uh, the toll that it can take, uh, as well as the importance of how sexuality can benefit you outside the bedroom in other words but to be call a spade a spade there is a good chance that a lot of the female partners out there have some degree or the beginnings of some degree of a dysfunction that could be very easily treated and remedied so we're going to take a slight foray into uh, some of the different female sexual dysfunctions many of which are quite treatable um, and could be the rate limiting step as to why some uh, couples may not be able to re-engage. Uh, perhaps, you know, shortly before they went through the treatment, it was the uh, uh, sexual act was already getting quite uncomfortable. You know, it was not something that was very enjoyable enjoyable for uh, her. Uh, then already had lost some desire, was not terribly interested in like even sort of say, hey, I'm actually quite happy about not being sexual at all. Uh, and if you are happy not being sexual, that's fine. But some women will, recognize that there's a difference between uh, wanting, not wanting to be sexual at all and not wanting to be sexual because the last time it hurt and would love to be able to get back to a spot where it was more comfortable and more mutually enjoyable if given an option and don't realize that there are. So FSD is short for female sexual dysfunction. So it is pretty common and underreported. And unfortunately, there's a lack of familiarity, both in physicians to describe the issues, even with docs, even knowing that there's treatments. Um, there's a lot of self-blame and patient embarrassment that comes with this. Unfortunately, there still are some dismissive docs out there who will say something ridiculous, like go home and have a glass of wine and a chocolate bar, and that's ridiculous. Um, but there's also a lot of patients who will believe that there are no treatments out there. But here, just sort of looking, this was a survey across a, a population of women in terms of them self-identifying that they have a problem. Um, and this is, there's a lot of interesting takes from this, but you know, about four, almost 40% think they have a desire problem, 20% think they have this uh, orgasm problem, about 44% any sort of dysfunction. What's really interesting is the next column where they say, well, I have a problem and I'm upset or distressed about it. And so there's a whole side conversation we can get into, into how would you think that you have a desire problem, but you're okay with it? Uh, how does that sort of fit? Very interesting social, social cultural discussion that could be had about that distinction. But still, between five and 10%, depending on what domain you're looking at, of women are identifying that they have a problem that they're upset with, that they'd like to fix. Um, and then even more interestingly, you go one step further in that they have a dysfunction of some sort. And if you've eliminated the fact that they, uh, any sort of depression or other mental health problem, it's the numbers aren't that different, but they're still in that same range. It does make you wonder if the original sexual problem is more a manifestation of some mental health thing. That's my uh, throwaway for uh, or my plug for always making sure that you as a caregiver 
are looking after your own mental health as much as you are your partners. Caregiver burnout is very definitely a thing. So do watch for yourself and look after yourself. So distressing sexual problems, age stratified. So this is a bit of an older study. So the 45 to 65 five years of age, uh, this was surveyed. If you look, this was published back in 2008. So this is almost 20 years ago. Uh, so you could almost add 15, 20 years to that age range in terms of who was in this group. And about 15% were saying that they have a dysfunction that they're upset about and they'd like to, uh, uh, they'd like to have that addressed. So when we're talking about uh, sort of the female sexual response cycle and the male sexual response cycle, you know, there was the, the old folks, uh, Masters and Johnson, for those who know who they are, some of the original sex therapists really described well the male sexual response cycle. It's very linear. You, know, you have desire, excitement, plateau, orgasm, and then resolution. It's a very straightforward, linear, linear thing. Um, with women, it, this model was also put forward to explain women and their sexual response cycle. Um, it's kind of like trying to fit a square peg through a round hole. You can kind of sort of make it work. You can see in the bottom right there, they have several different paths, some leading to orgasm, some not, some with multiple orgasms. It just, it doesn't really fit. Uh, and that's why later we've come up with more of a cycle. It's much more cyclical in what happens. And what you can see here is that the spontaneous sexual drive is really central to this. However, uh, part of this is being seeking out and being receptive to the sexual stimuli. Now, why that's an important part is, well, the sexual stimuli may be there, but if they're not particularly receptive, then it's, it's not gonna be received well, and that doesn't move on to the sexual stimulation and arousal. And in fact, can be somewhat of a barrier to sexual stimulation and arousal. Obviously, the biological and psychological components feed into the cycle there on the bottom right too. So if there are limitations, you may be interested in receiving the sexual stimuli, but because you know the last time it really hurt or you're really worried about something, uh, you're worried, worried about being with him and in some way that might hurt him or hurt yourself, um, then that can interrupt the cycle and derail it, if you will. But an important part of this is that you go through the rest of it, arousal, arousal, and drive. So the arousal is, is also facilitating the drive as well. But you get to that emotional, physical satisfaction, probably one of the more important pieces is that emotional intimacy part. Because the more the connectedness that you get with the emotional intimacy is what's going to lead to being more receptive to further sexual stimuli down the road. So it, it truly is a cycle. And I think it, this is a much better way of trying to describe uh, female sexual response than, than a forced linear way of doing it. So what are the takeaways? Well, libido, drive, and desire are central to the model. Um, seeking out and being receptive is critical for the model to perceive, uh, to proceed. And physical sexual intimacy can create a positive feedback to the emotional intimacy, which then a lot feeds back positively to being more receptive, which then feeds back to, again, the physical intimacy. And the emotional relationship components of the encounter can be just as important or critical to the response cycle and the physical stimuli. All right, so taking a step back and talking about the different ways that uh, uh, that the female partners can have a dysfunction. Well, there's desire problems, arousal problems, orgasm problems, and pain problems. When it comes to arousal, there's a few different ways things can go sideways. One is what we would call sub subjective sexual arousal disorder. So this is that you'll get no emotional feelings of arousal. You don't get that a uh, little zip, that, that interest of arousal when either you're being stimulated or you're wanting to engage, but biologically, everything works okay. You start to see more lubrication in the vagina, there's more blood flow going to the vagina, all of those parts are fine, there's increased blood flow going to the, to the breast, the nipples, etc. All of that is happening, but that psychological, emotional, physical, uh, sorry, emotional connection and it is not there. So you get this, this break. You can also have the opposite. You have all of the physical, emotional connections. So you have all the psychological and emotional connections and a need for emotional intimacy, but you have no biological response. And that's a slightly different arousal disorder. And then not so much in this population that we're talking about, but you can have the exact opposite of this, too much arousal. Something called persistent genital arousal disorder. 
And this is a spontaneous, intrusive, and unwanted sexual arousal without any stimuli. This is often they'll have you having spontaneous orgasms. Um, it's incredibly, incredibly disruptive. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty rare syndrome, but it, it definitely can happen. Um, you tend to see it more often on TV shows because it makes for great TV. Uh, but if you've ever met somebody who's had it, it's, it's, it's debilitating. It's a, it's a really awful situation to be in. When it comes to orgasm, we really just have the female orgasmic disorder, which is a very big definition, lack of orgasm despite high levels of self-reported arousal. Um, and it can be too early, too late, it can be spontaneous, it can be absent or reduced intensity or satisfaction. Um, they could be having pain or mood or cognitive changes associated with uh, or right after orgasm. And when it comes to orgasm, uh, as well as desire uh, and arousal, one of the most common culprits actually are antidepressants. And there's certain different neurotransmitters that explain why some are higher than others. Uh, but the, the most commonly used ones are the ones that are at the top of the list. Now, this is not to say that that means that you'd have to, in order to improve things, you have to come off uh, because obviously your mental health is extremely important and making sure that that's maintained is probably paramount. It's just more of an explanation as to why there can be some desire and arousal or even orgasm difficulties that can occur because there is a higher percentage of women over 50 who are going to be on one of these medications. And in fact, there's a few of these medications, uh, this one down here, Benlethoxine in particular, which is actually used sometimes to treat some of the menopausal symptoms. Uh, so that, uh, so they may be on this for another reason entirely. And then as a result, they're getting some sexual dysfunctions. Now there's generally work around these, but in terms of why, sometimes this is the why. So dyspareunia, that's the fancy name for pain with sex. The vast majority of the time, this is coming from what's called the vestibule. So what is the vestibule? Well, it's the entryway into the vagina. It is not the outside parts. That's what we call the vulva. It's not the inside part. That's the vagina. It's that only a couple of centimeters long portion uh, where it's most narrow when the penis goes in, right near where you pee out of. That little section, that's called the vestibule. Um, there are some anatomical landmarks as to where exactly that is, but if it really just goes from this thing called heart's line, which is on the bottom of the inside lip. And it's just that little distance from there to just past the hymenal ring. That's it, that very small section. However, that very small section is a completely different distinct bit of tissue than all the rest of the genital tissues. Uh, and it responds very differently. And actually it's very testosterone sensitive, very, which is really interesting. Uh, so in a more of a picture sort of form, you have the vulva, which is the outside, the vagina, that's the inside, and you've got the vestibule, which is your doorway, okay? And that often can cause particularly insertional pain. Something goes in and it really hurts or burns, then yes, then this is often where you're going to see that, uh, you're going to have that pain. So what's the fancy word for, you know, that area being in pain? Well, we say vestibulodynia, big fancy word, uh, but it's pain that's generally confined to the vestibule. It generally stops right by that heart's line, and there's generally no pain inside the vagina proper. And again, so this little sort of picture, and then you can see sort of heart's line is just there, just to the inside of the vagina. Um, and for some, some women who have a little bit more skin color, you're gonna actually see it very clearly uh, when you're, when you, if you were taking a look. Now, what are some of the hormonal changes that happen in the female genital tract? Again, a lot of men who are with their partners, uh, who are, uh, they're going to be at the time where they're going either through menopause or have left that in the, in the past. Those hormones have stopped. And if you're not taking something, there's going to be some changes that happen to the genital tract. It can take years for these changes to sink in, but they can happen. In the vulva, that's the outside part, you can have shrinkage or loss of the labia minora. Those are those inner lips. And those can be really important for lubrication, uh, for cushioning that occurs during sexual activity. Uh, and so that can really make some make it really difficult to engage in sex. In the vestibule, the urethra, which is normally quite flat and back in a way, it can almost sort of pucker up, um, and it it, uh, it it looks different. It doesn't actually cause too much, aside from some women will get some increased urinary frequency and maybe some stinging or burning with peeing. Um, and you can also get a bunch of little red spots along the vestibule, and that's what where it can make it really painful. Uh, to pass anything. 
through the vestibule. And then deeper into the vagina, you can have the lubrication loss. You can have loss of the stretch and the elasticity of the vagina itself. It gets some color changes. It becomes a little bit less pink and a little bit more kind of a whitish or a pale pink. Uh, there's all the lovely folds inside the vagina uh, that allow for a lot of its elasticity and those get flattened out. So there's less give. And it's, if it's really stretching every time something's going in there, it's going to be really uncomfortable. And then also the vagina with hormone changes will lose some of its acidity. So this is something where it has nothing to do with sexual activity, has everything to do with preventing urinary tract infections. If the vagina is nice and acidic, that's your natural protection against infections. But when you lose your hormones, you tend to lose the acidity within the vagina. So what causes these changes? Well, the one, most common is something called genital urinary syndrome of menopause, what we used to call vulvovaginal atrophy. Um, it's been changed to the genital urinary because we wanted to really include, there's not just the genitalia, it's the urinary problems too. And there, everything is affected. These are generally age-related changes to the drop in sex hormones. Um, you can also have an, after a sudden loss of hormones, say after a surgical menopause, or if you had to have your ovaries taken out when you were younger, before you had gone through menopause. Um, and there's also a minor version of this that actually happens after every pregnancy. Uh, it's not a full menopause, but usually after, right after uh, having a, a child in your postpartum and your breastfeeding, the hormones are not quite back online. And this is one of the reasons why it's sometimes a little bit more difficult to have a child while you're still breastfeeding because these hormones are a little bit altered. It's mother nature's way of child spacing. Basically, if you're not terribly interested in sex and it hurts when you have sex, well, you're very likely not going to have another kid soon. And it's going to give your body some time to recover before you go and have another child. That's a sort of a built-in built -in mechanism. There is something else called hormonally mediated vestibulodynia. This is a little bit different. This has to often do with there being an isolated testosterone deficiency. There are certain drugs, treatments, uh, and sometimes just on your own that this can happen. It's not necessarily related to, to menopause, but it can be. Um, and like I said here, it's often related to a hormonal birth control in some younger women. Um, here, it just feels like every time something gets inserted the vagina through the vestibule, it feels like you're having sex with a butcher knife. It's just a sharp, ripping, tearing feeling. It's, it feels awful. Usually with some topical creams, we can get it to be totally comfortable, but, you know, it's something we have to look into. And then I kind of have on here, are these the cost of aging and birth control? It, it doesn't have to be. There's ways of controlling and making all of these things better. Uh, it's just about seeking care and advocating for yourself. So what about some of the desire disorders? Well, there are there is some desire dysfunctions. These, this one in particular called HSDD or hypoactive sexual desire disorder, it's not at all related to any hormonal abnormalities. It's absent, reduced desire, uh, loss of fantasy, avoiding the situations that lead to sexual activity, loss of initiation. Um, usually when we're talking about this, we're talking about this in a, what we call acquired, meaning that you used to have uh, a good sexual appetite and you were happy with it. Now you're in this situation where you have very little to no desire. You're actively trying to avoid situations, but you recognize that this isn't you and you'd like to fix things. So it's when you have that kind of distinction, that, that uh, difference between what you're feeling like and what you want, and you don't have that want to want it can be distressing. Um, so there's ways of diagnosing it. We have a desire screener to see if uh, that's a quick way of identifying somebody who might have a desire problem. Uh, lifelong HSDD is a lot more difficult to diagnose. It takes a lot more diving into the history, uh, but acquired is usually pretty, pretty quick to pick up. Uh, lots of causes. We, we often blame those SSRIs, those are those antidepressant medications. They can cause a syndrome that's like this. Certain medical diseases and problems can cause this. Um, I do have on here, I do put the hormones on here. I know I said before, this is not hormonally related. It's, it can look the exact same. And when you identify that it's a hormonally related issue, you treat the hormonally related issue and then it goes away. Um, and some of these are normal effects or we call them normal or maybe expected. These are things of what happens after pregnancy, uh, menopause, and then things that are abnormal. And all the bits get actually taken out or related to certain drugs. Again, anxiety, depression, previous trauma can all have an effect on this. Um, and if it hurts, well, 
it's you're not going to be very sexual or want to be very sexual if every time you do it hurts so if there is a hormonal component like i said you treat it uh, we often give them give women some testosterone it's amazing how well this actually works usually just a topical little cream um, now there is no for, uh, formal evaluation uh, sorry treatment for this so we basically have to MacGyver some of the men's formulations to make it work. Um, lots of safety data, but there's nothing official. This is all technically off book, off label use in this particular situation. Well, what is what am I talking about? Low testosterone women. I thought testosterone was a man's hormone. It's not. It's a sex hormone, and testosterone is really important for sexual drive and desire in women, just as it is in men. The difference is men have about ten times the, the volume of testosterone as women do. But the little bit of testosterone that women have is incredibly important for them, okay? Um, we really don't know how many women suffer from this because we really haven't measured this properly or well at all. Um, and there's no society that agrees upon what is the diagnosis. This has really mostly been built off just a lot of experience in figuring out what seems to work and what doesn't. Um, and like I said, most experts use the 10 to 1 rule. So whatever you're going to replace, you're looking for about one-tenth of what you would do in a guy. Uh, so that gives us some estimates as to what we would aim for for normal values. So in testosterone in women, this is a little bit technical, but there's a bunch of different forms of testosterone that exist in women. There's testosterone like we think about. There's something called DHT. It's a very specific, highly potent form of testosterone. There's inactive pro-hormones that exist in our circulating Here's what's interesting. In pre-menopausal women, about a quarter of your testosterone is coming from the ovary. About a quarter is coming from the adrenal, which is a little gland that's above your kidney. About half is coming from this conversion of these inactive parts. So that these inactive things are being created and secreted and circulating. And then somewhere, whether it's a fat cell or something else, somewhere else in your body will convert it to a normal testosterone. Uh, it's testosterone's lowest when you are cycling, it's lowest in the early follicular phase. So that's kind of the uh, uh, right after the bleed is finished. And it's highest right when uh, you're mid-cycle. So when you ovulated, which makes sense because that's often when uh, there may be an increase in sexual drive and desire, often time when women would potentially be fertile, i.e. when they've ovulated. Uh, with testosterone and aging, there is a slow decline that goes with aging. This is expected. It does plateau or stop with menopause. And this last part is important for those who've had surgery on their ovaries. The ovary is still producing testosterone even when it's not producing estrogen after menopause. Okay, So that's why we will have some women who were doing okay sexually, and then they had to have their ovaries taken out for some reason. They had already passed menopause. They're in their 60s. Um, something came up in their ovaries. They went and they had their ovaries taken out. And now they're starting to get some new sexual problems. Well, there was still some production from those ovaries before, and then we took them out. Uh, we often think of the ovaries as being just shriveled up and useless beyond menopause. They're still doing things. They're still there and they still have value. Now there is this medication. Uh, this is what's used. It's a non-hormonal medication for hypoactive sexual desire disorder. It is available in Canada. These are some older slides, but it is available in Canada. It's very interesting in how it works. It almost works like an exact antidote to the way that an antidepressant causes a sexual dysfunction. This seems to do the opposite in a really targeted way. Um, it is FDA approved and it's approved in Canada in 2018. Uh, the biggest problem is that this is really, really costly. Um, some insurance companies help you with the cover of the cost, but not all of them. Kind of depends how they've coded it. Um, it can really be helpful, but it's uh, but it, it's a it's a hard sell to, for somebody, particularly on a fixed income, to suddenly come up with with that kind of money. Um, unfortunately, when it came out, a lot of the media was saying, "Oh, it's the female Viagra," and it could not be further from the truth. It's it basically completely undercut a lot of the, the confidence in this drug. You know, Viagra would be needed just before sex, and this is a daily medication. You have to be on it for thirty days before it does anything. It takes about a couple of hours for Viagra to work. And again, like I said, you need to be on it for 30 days to do anything. Viagra is just working on blood vessels. Uh, this medication, Flavanserin or Adi, it's actually altering the neurotransmitters to try and improve desire and drive. Um, so it, there's a lot of differences between them. They're not all 
uh, related. The only thing that they have in common is that they both have to do with sexuality. That's about it. There was some controversy when it first came out. Initially, there was, it, it does make you fairly sleepy. And so there was some confident concerns about uh, women taking this and then not being able to drive properly the next day. And they actually did a, a study and they found out that the women who took it actually did, did better on the driving simulators, probably because they got better rest. Um, and then there was some concerns of combining it with alcohol. It was an incredibly flawed study. They basically had them drink a 750 milliliter bottle of wine nine hours fasted on an empty stomach in 20 minutes and were surprised people were passing. It's the most ridiculous study I've ever seen. Anyways, Health Canada, when they had a chance to review this information, they looked at that study, said this study is ridiculous and they tossed it out. So there's no alcohol warning in Canada, but there was in the States for some time that you weren't permitted to drink alcohol if you were on it. Um, so I was kind of wrapping it up. So prostate cancer patients will guarantee have some degree of a sexual dysfunction. This is normal. Uh, that can lead them to feeling like they are less of themselves, less of a man, less being able to provide or produce. And as a result, the, these uh, as a result of these complications, regardless of anything that you have to say, this may still be something that is gnawing away at them, uh, gnawing away at a lot of patients. Some partners think that they should have to deny their desires to protect the ego of their partner. You do not have to do this. If you have sexual concerns, desires, needs, wants, talk to them about your, with your part, talk about them to your partner. It doesn't have to be the way that you used to be, uh, but there's almost always a way for everybody to leave the table happy. It, but it does involve having some really open conversations that Historically, all of us have not necessarily been comfortable having that degree of openness and vulnerability with our partner uh, to ask for what you want and to figure out a way to do that. And maybe go on some websites you wouldn't have gone to before or go on a couple of stores you never would have gone into. But there's ways of making these things happen. Many of the partners are gonna have their own challenges, hormone problems, desire problems, maybe their own cancer challenges, their own surgical therapies. Um, and it's always going to be important to talk to your family doctor. Uh, they can at least get you started. And if they run out of options or ideas on how to help, they can send to someone like myself or others, uh, who might be able to help out to try and make things as comfortable and as enjoyable as possible to reopen and re-engage with that sexuality. And again, don't forget the toys. Uh, I know that a lot of times we are very embarrassed to be looking at toys and, um, but they can really make a difference in terms of being able to allow couples who are meeting some challenges to be able to re-engage uh, in some way such that they could have the physical closeness that they're looking for again with their partner. And I think that's the last slide. Yes. All right. I'm gonna stop sharing here. Thank you very much, Dr. Garcia. Uh, you always have the fun presentations. <laughs> uh, I, I just wanted to point out, this is the third uh, of our doctor series. And we kind of, uh, for um, our 2023, and we wanted to end off our doctor series with Dr. Garcia, because he always has those fun presentations. And it's, he, always, uh, he always gives me a bit of a chuckle. Um, I just wanted to say, uh, James, before we get into the question and uh, Q&A session, can you please pop up the uh, polls? Uh, we'll we'll uh, just, um, we'll have the polls first and then we'll stop recording. And do you want to do the polls while we're recording? Uh, yes, please. Okay. You should see the poll now. Yes. Can everyone see that? Can you please? Answer. This is giving us an idea of where everyone had gotten their information about our tonight's meeting. Uh, we're doing this for metrics because we're trying to get more awareness out there in regards to um, prostate uh, support groups and how we can better improve them for the people of uh, Regina and Saskatchewan. Okay, do you want to do yours? Mm 
Thank you for taking this short survey. It won't take long. You choose to answer those questions. We'll allow another minute just for people just to make um, give their responses. Okay, so it looks like the majority of our people so far have, we have 11. Their... We have 11 people that have completed the survey. You want to leave it open another minute? We have 12 now. Yes, please. We'll just leave it. One, to... one more minute. And then I can show the results once we close the poll. Okay, I don't see any more responses. I'm going to end the poll and I'm going to share the results. So um, I don't know if I have to scroll through this, so you have to, but yeah. Um, we have one out of 12 who saw the ad in last Saturdays. We've had one who saw uh, the notice in the senior living paper, six who received the notice through our e, e newsletter. Um, and two on the website. And let's see here. Um, one from the Ellen Blair Center and one person from a friend. The, the second question was, I don't know, it was a junk question. Sorry about that. That was me. But you chose number one, which was important. And uh, for people that, uh, if you do not receive the monthly newsletter, you want to receive it. So 10 people who do not receive it said they would like to, and we'll tell you how to do that. And we also asked the question, if you'd like to speak with a volunteer peer counselor. Um, and one person said yes, seven people said no, and four people said maybe. And so I just wanna thank everybody for, for completing that survey. It was really helpful information, thank you. And to uh, contact our peer counselors, for those of you, uh, I am one of the peer counselors. Uh, and we have a list. We have Lawrence, who is one, and uh, Stanley. And you will find that on our website. Um, the other thing that you may find is that uh, we are going to be doing more on Facebook and YouTube. So we're working diligently diligently trying to get that up and running for everyone so that you can access uh, our, our videos that we've recorded and so that we can have more peer counseling via Facebook and social media. So we're still working at it. We haven't forgotten about it, but we're still, still at it. Um, I'm going to hit stop recording. There we but go. Do you want to say anything more about? Uh, I just want to thank you, uh, Dr. Garcia. Thank you so much for coming on. And this doesn't mean uh, you're off the hook yet, but we're going to stop recording. Now. <laughs>